So Erica, you've been working on the question of the beauty of war mm -hmm. and um, a happy coincidence has arisen. So mm -hmm. last night or the other night in freshman seminar, we were reading book one of the Republic mm -hmm. with the, and I was trying to get the freshmen to appreciate that there is a problem with the virtue of justice. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look on the face of it, that beautiful, you know, like yes. paying your taxes, not cheating. <laughs> Stopping you know. at stop signs. That's right. <laughs> um, and I gave them a contrast to the virtue of courage. And I, I said, you know, when you see some beautiful, uh, you see a courageous warrior like we encountered in the mm -hmm. Iliad time and again, um, risking their lives, killing, dying, that looks beautiful. Running away, mm -hmm. waving your arms, saying, save me, save me, looks ugly. Mm -hmm. And some of them got it, but others said, so what's so beautiful about killing and dying in war? Mm -hmm. So that, I thought that's a good question. What is beautiful about it? so difficult to think this through and this is one of the things that I find helpful about Homer is that he puts the beauty so much on the surface right up against the ugliness mm -hmm. you know we go from images of spectacular natural events in particular to images of heads rolling in the dust you know within several lines you'll get something like you know people approaching as the snow melts and forms a torrent flying down the mountain you know mm -hmm. there's these beautiful cascading water breaking loose from the ice. And then three lines later, someone's head is chewing at the dust as they bleed out. And I think the juxtaposition there makes me wonder whether there's some way in which the violence is in dialogue with nature in a way that makes facing up to violence, facing up to one's death, being courageous, somehow gives it a kind of depth, attaches it to the deepest things, like the beauty in nature. So there's something kind of primal about it, I think. So that makes it sound, that is the experience of battle, mm -hmm. sound elemental exactly. and natural. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, the kind of, you know, the kind of images one sees there may mm -hmm. be similar to the images that inspire you know, a romantic poet, for example, yes. to write a beautiful poem about nature, or even a love poem, mm -hmm. you know, with flowers and moonlight and, you know, the sun. So, I mean, that's, well, that just makes me want to press this further. I mean, I mean, do you want to, do you want to then claim that these warriors, by displaying their beauty in battle, and we, we should look at some scenes mm -hmm. too, by the way, and really probe this, are making themselves objects of love to so, us as readers or, mm -hmm. or to each other? That's interesting that you frame it as the soldiers themselves making themselves objects of love because I wonder too about the role of Homer, the poet. I mean, mm -hmm. he is, he's the one giving us the images of armies as flocking birds, including swans, you know, the most elegant of the birds and the images of men dying like wilting flowers, you know, these beautiful images. Homer seems like he might be the one making them into objects of love. But it's interesting to think about the possibility that they themselves, these men, in some way, want to engage in war in the manner of a kind of romantic passion. Yes. Something primal like the forces of nature that Homer depicts when mm -hmm. he's trying to show us what it's like for them. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's it. Maybe he's trying to show us what it's like to be them in battle. He's not just describing what it would look like if one were to watch, watch it happen. Yeah. So that makes me think of that scene in early on in, in Homer, mm -hmm. his book four or five, when Hector is leaving his family, mm -hmm. his wife and his child. And, you know, so there you get the more conventional domestic attraction of mm -hmm love in marriage and domestic love but he's going out to fight and he's joined by paris mm -hmm. who has been in bed with helen mm -hmm. and paris comes out of of that the boudoir sort of mm -hmm. frisky like a horse yes and playful mm -hmm. and just ready to go into mm -hmm. well i was with helen 
making love. Now I'm going to go out and do something beautiful mm -hmm. on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. But there again, it's as like what you were saying, that there's something just continuous about mm -hmm. those experiences. Shall we look at that scene? Sure, yeah, the scene where Paris bursts forth from the bedroom like a horse that's been kept in the stables a bit too long. Do you know where it is? Off the top of my head, perhaps not. Okay, I will Let's tell see. you. Let's see, Helen and Paris make love in it's book the, three. The end of book six, and, very end of book six. Okay. So let me read a little. Um, Paris, in turn, did not linger long in his high house, but when he had put on his glorious armor with browns elaborate, he ran in the confidence of his quick feet mm -hmm. through the city, as when some stalled horse who has been corn-fed at the manger, breaking free of his rope, gallops over the plain in thunder to his accustomed bathing place in a sweet running river, and in the pride of his strength holds high his head, and the mane floats over his shoulders, Sure of his glorious strength, the quick knees carry him to the loved places and pasture of horses. So, from uttermost Pergamos came Paris, mm. the son of Priam, shining in all his armor of war as the sun shines, laughing aloud, and his quick feet carried him. Suddenly thereafter he came on brilliant Hector, his brother, where he lingered before turning away from the place where he had talked with his lady. Uh, and then Hector says to him a few lines <laughs> down, strange man, there's no way that one giving judgment and fairness could dishonor your work in battle since you are a strong man, but of your own accord you hang back, unwilling. And my heart is grieved in its thought when I hear shameful things spoken about you by the Trojans who undergo hard fighting for your sake. Let us go now. Some day hereafter we'll make all right with the immortal gods in the sky, if Zeus grants it, setting up to them in our houses the wine bowls of liberty after we have driven out of Troy the strong, grieved Achaeans. Mm. Now, what do you make of that? <laughs> One of the things I love about this particular scene is the fact that the horse, who is Paris, bursts forth as though he's been yearning for it. Yeah. You know, as though you know, he's been fed in the manger. And this translation has it as a stallion full fed at the manger stalled too long, breaking free of his tether gallops down the plain, out for his favorite plunge in a river's cool currents, that there's something in this creature that wants this and has been wanting it. Mm -hmm. And he's been in bed with Helen. Yeah. You know, of all the domestic situations, you would think that might be at a premium. That's yeah. that's the one you'd want. Yeah. And even so, this is what he wants. This, there's something in him. The stallion in yeah. him wants to be out there and, you know, getting the glory, sure yeah. and sleek in his glory. Yeah. That glory's not in the bedroom, even if it is Helen in there with him. The laughter strikes me too. <laughs> I mean, he has a kind of, a kind of, you know, jovial, even comic spirit. Mm -hmm. And so, what Hector says, he ought to be ashamed of. It seems to slide right off him. Mm -hmm. he, that there's a time for making love, and there's mm -hmm. a time for making war, and I'm I'm pretty good at both. Mm -hmm. I can have it all. <laughs> you, you think that's right? I think I mean, the example of Paris is a tricky one because it goes so poorly on such a catastrophic scale that uh -huh. he has attempted to have it both ways. You know, to be to have have the woman, he'll he'll just help himself to whoever's woman, and at the same time to want to be manly. And there's something difficult, I think, about his sort of willingness to dally off the battlefield, yeah. then partake of battle when he's ready to. Yeah. I don't know that it's a man's prerogative to pick and choose. Do you think um, with Paris in mind, and maybe Hector too later on, that one can be both sometimes a coward, sometimes mm -hmm. courageous, sometimes beautiful in battle, sometimes ugly in battle? Mm -hmm. I think that if it were not possible to be more than one thing at once, perhaps even things that are in tension all at once, this poem and life itself would not be nearly as interesting as it is. I think Homer just sort of wonderfully presents us with that kind of complexity, exactly that difficulty that the best of the Trojans, Hector, could ultimately 
turn tail and run in a moment of fear that his wheeze could his knee, knees could go weak in As a moment of fear yeah. and he could just run for it and not in that moment lose everything else that he has that makes him beautiful glorious <laughs> courageous this is this is not the sort of downfall of all of Hector's virtue in this moment I don't think I mean Homer has anchored all of these things in his character deeply in what we've seen of him and so I think we're not obligated to sort of pin these human beings down as being this thing or that thing. They are so many things, all of them. Mm -hmm. So that you know, let's keep that point in mind, you know, the multiplicity mm -hmm. of, of character and possibility. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to press first the question of what exactly is one seeing mm -hmm. when one is seeing a warrior either run, mm -hmm. which I was previously calling ugly, or standing firm or even charging forward, mm -hmm. which I was calling beautiful. What is it exactly that we're seeing? Mm -hmm. you know, one word used in the, in the passage here, though they're not yet in battle, is, is glorious. Right. You know, what does it mean to see glory? Mm -hmm. Or what does it mean to see its opposite, whatever that might be? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I mean, I just... It does. I mean, I think the emphasis on to see glory is important because it seems clear that glory, whatever it is, to be seen is intrinsic to it. It's not glory except to the extent that it is there shining forth to be seen. So this question of what exactly it is one is seeing when an act takes place on the battlefield. It sort of, it seems to me that's sort of what you're asking. That, yes, you know, when, exactly. when the act of battle takes place, what is it you're seeing apart from the, the sort of outward manifestation. And I want to think that it's in part what's happening in this man at this moment, but that in part too, it's the connection to what's greater than the man that you, in the moments of glory, somehow the man is playing out what is glorious in a general, in a broader sense, in a, maybe a universal sense that he is in some way a vessel for this thing that is glory, mm -hmm. that is not particular to him exactly. You know, you want to own your glory, but what you're partaking of seems like it has to be beyond the individual in order to be as magnificent as it is. So yeah. Perhaps you see so, something that looks like a kind of distilled virtue, you know, this moment of distilled virtue that shines in a way that perhaps off the battlefield, nothing can shine quite yeah. as brightly. So the word shining, I think mm -hmm. that's crucial and interesting. It suggests light mm -hmm. or stars. I think Homer uses the image of a star mm -hmm. when Hector swoops in mm -hmm. on Achilles. You mm -hmm. could look at that in a moment. But I mean, that also suggests that it's an act that enables seeing. So it's not mm -hmm. only a question of what are you seeing, but now for the first time, mm -hmm. you can see. Mm -hmm. something that was always, perhaps always there, mm -hmm. but one doesn't see it until that moment. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? One wonders whether these men have moments of self-discovery in the acts of battle themselves. This idea that maybe they see themselves very clearly when ultimately they do charge forth or turn tail and run. That mm -hmm. it may be that they're seeing what they wouldn't otherwise be able to see in themselves were it not tested with these sort of ultimate stakes. So maybe that is part of it, that war makes visible the things inside a human being that might not otherwise be findable or seeable yeah. in quite such such stark terms. Yeah. Something inside us, but also maybe something that's present right at our elbows mm -hmm. all the time. So I was thinking of that passage when Sarpedon is speaking to his friend Glaucus mm -hmm. before they start charge the walls that the Achaeans had mm -hmm. built up around their ships. And they have a little speech together about why they're doing this. Mm -hmm. can, can we look at that? Sure, yes. There we go. Shall I read this one or would you like to? Why don't you go ahead? Okay. So, Sarpedon, son of Zeus, uh, is speaking to his friend Glaucus before the charge. Glaucus. Why is it you and I are honored before others with pride of place, the choice meats and the filled wine cups in Lycia? And all men look on us as if we were immortals and we are appointed a great place of land by the banks of Byzantos, good land, 
orchard and vineyard and plowland for the planting of wheat. Therefore, it's our duty in the forefront of the Lactaeans to take our stand and bear our part in the blazing of battle, so that a man of the close-armored Lycaeans may say of us, Indeed, these are no ignoble men who are lords of Lycaea, these kings of ours who feed upon the fat sheep appointed and drink the exquisite sweet wine, since indeed there is strength of valor in them, since they are fighting in the forefront of the Lycaeans. Man, supposing you and I escaping this battle would be able to live on forever, ageless, immortal. So neither would I myself go on fighting in the foremost, nor would I urge you into the fighting where men win glory. But now, seeing that the spirits of death stand close about us in their thousands, no man can turn aside nor escape them. Let us go on and win glory for ourselves or yield it to others. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is extraordinary. Yes. You know, he seems to be saying, I'll just paraphrase it very simply. Tell me if I'm going too far. <laughs> Since death is all around us, at our elbows, mm -hmm. and we're not immortal, and we're going to die, mm -hmm. the thing to do is to charge into battle and Off win glory. Yes. Mm -hmm. but yeah. That's... Is that a, a natural human thought that people have? Or mm -hmm. is that something exceptional? Mm -hmm. It's ugly, but since it can't be escaped, let's approach it <laughs> rather than run yeah. from it. Something like this. Let's charge right into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's an interesting question whether or not it's natural because it does seem like it takes a scenario like this concoct a situation in which such a question would even come to mind. You know, there are not many situations where this particular issue is as starkly on the face of things as it is when one is mm -hmm. overwhelmed by the enemy and clearly facing one's death right now. So I think, you know, there may be something deep in the human being that when presented with such a thing says, well, it's ugly, but maybe it'll be beautiful when I go toward it, you know, maybe this is the way in which the sort of horror of death, of being gone, of being nothing, of going down to Hades and being a shade, the horror of that maybe in some way is offset by the beauty of the charge toward it, which would yeah. be interesting that it takes something, something hideous to present us with an opportunity to do something so beautiful is a kind of complicated and difficult idea, I think. Yes, it is complicated. I mean, he speaks of it first as duty, mm -hmm. first as a way of justifying the good life that we've got mm -hmm. as the lords of Achaia with all this land, with all this, you know, mm -hmm. prosperity. So it's a matter of, on the one hand, of confirming who you are in the eyes of others, but then he pushes it further. It's, mm -hmm. it's precisely because we're not immortal that we have to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, win glory for ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and it may be precisely because they're not immortal that they can win glory. If one can't die, I don't know that one can do something glorious. It's quite a paradox, though, mm -hmm. that one risks death, or in this mm -hmm. case of Sarpedon, one dies. Yeah. They all die. All the great yeah. ones in this book, except you know, Odysseus. Um, you... you become immortal by dying. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so that people, as he says, will speak of us mm -hmm. in a certain way. Mm -hmm. That seems to me important too, that they have some consciousness, not only of the spirits of death, mm -hmm. but of speech. Mm -hmm. That this is action turning into mm -hmm. poetry. Yeah, so that's interesting. I guess it would be a way in which this sort of complicated relationship between one's actions become someone else's speeches, and thus your actions transcend your mortality in some way by living beyond you. And I guess maybe critical to all of that is this idea of glory. You know, maybe mm -hmm. that's what it is to be glorious, to do something that could survive beyond you because it would be worth turning into words, mm -hmm. that it could be 
put into speech. I guess that sort of puts Homer in an interesting position since he's put all of this into speech. You know, it's up to him to show us if there's beauty here, if there's glory here, to make it manifest by taking these actions and turning them into words. Their, their honor is in Homer's hands, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. you know, that's a kind of trust, though, in the, in the future, a trust that it will be recorded, mm -hmm. not forgotten. Right. You know, it reminds me, Herodotus opens his mm -hmm. histories, saying, I'm writing these histories of the Persian Wars mm -hmm. precisely to make sure that the great things that were done mm -hmm. and the names of the doers will not be forgotten. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cassandra says in the Oresteia, sort of the complimentary flip side of that, that there is nothing worse than to die and simply be forgotten. You know, she begs, yeah, yeah. someone please care after I'm dead. So does that mean it's not really death? It's mm -hmm. being forgotten? One's it, name, yeah. one's deeds, having all of that disappear from memory? Mm -hmm. That's the thing to be overcome? It looks like something like that must be true. And I wonder why, you know, whether perhaps that's the origin of this idea, glory, that we as human beings, there must, surely there is something in our deeds. There's some possibility of doing something that will transcend our mortality. And maybe the name we give to that desire fulfilled mm -hmm. is glory. Uh, but there's something else then. Okay, because that, I think I understand that. But then why... Uh, when Sarpedon faces Patroclus and is killed by Patroclus, mm -hmm. um, and his his dying words are not uh, to his friend Glaucus again are not mm -hmm. you know remember me you know write about me mm -hmm. tell my story you know mm -hmm. that by the way are Hamlet's dying words mm -hmm. uh, but it's make sure they don't strip my armor right. and carry off my body mm -hmm. so. Why is that so important, a piece mm -hmm. of this equation that we're talking about? Yeah. So I've been reading Hannah Arendt, and she talks a lot about the world of the human artifice, that mm -hmm. part of what we do that marks out the fact that we actually have a life and a death, that we are born and we die in a decisive way because there is a world of things that we've made outside of ourselves into which we're born and out of which we pass. And she makes much of the idea that the things that we make, the actual material world that we construct, provides the context in which we can be actors, doers, and not just a part of the endless cycle of nature. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether that's a key part of this, that somehow glory has to be manifest in the world, you know, uh -huh. in that human artifice that she talks about. Because if it's not manifest somehow in the world, it's, it's not there really making our deeds into something that can be passed along. You know, the material aspect of this is interesting. They so, care so much about the so armor. So the words are not enough in a way. Somehow They're it's, too yeah. airy. You, know, you need, mm -hmm. the armor has to be kept. You know, mm -hmm. The body has to be properly mm -hmm. um, uh, taken mm -hmm. from the battlefield and given the ritual funeral mm -hmm. and all. And the glory itself has to be somehow manifest in that material world of men's mm -hmm. making, not just in the idea of a great deed or in you know reverence for those who those who complete the great deeds. It looks to me like, at least for these men, glory needs to be worldly too. Mm -hmm. And you see glory in the worldly form maybe when the sun shines on the shields mm -hmm. and when the armor is recovered and you know, given to the man who loved the one who died, these kinds of things, that it's important that it be there yeah. physically, materially, manifest. Yeah, that's it. We should look at Sarpedon's death. Sure. I want to ask you if you think it's beautiful. Mm. So do you know where that is? Let's see. That would be, yes. It is I book 16. 16. Before down Sarpedon fell as an oak or white poplar falls, at line 570 in Fagel's okay. rendering, but I believe it's offset from most of the other translations. So it's sort of, it'll be somewhere in the range of 462 to 494. Yeah, I've got it. Shall okay. I read it? Great. Okay. So Sarpedon is facing Patroclus, who's wearing Achilles' armor and is on a great rampage going mm -hmm. through the Trojans. Um, 
and we hear the following. Once again, Sarpedon threw wide with a cast of his shining spear, so that the pointed head overshot the left shoulder of Patroclus. And now Patroclus made the second cast with the brazen spear, and the shaft escaping his hand was not flung vainly, but struck with a beating heart in close in the arch of the muscles. He, Sarpedon, fell as when an oak goes down, or a white poplar, or like a towering pine, which in the mountains the carpenters have been hoeing down with their wetted axes to make ship timber. So he lay there, felled, in front of his horses and chariots, roaring, and clawed with his hands at the bloody dust, or as a blazing and haughty bull in a huddle of shambling cattle, when a lion has come among the herd and destroys him, dies bellowing under the hooked claws of the lion. So now, before Patroclus, the lord of the shield-armored Lycaeans, Sarpedon, died raging and called aloud to his beloved companion, Dear Clauchus, you are a fighting, you're a fighter among men. Now the need comes hardest upon you to be a spearman and a bold warrior. Now, if you are brave, let bitter warfare be dear to you. First, you must go among all the men who are lords of Lycaeans everywhere and stir them up to fight for Sarpedon, and then you yourself must fight for me with the bronze spear, for I shall be a thing of shame and a reproach said of you afterwards, mm -hmm. all your days forever, if the Achaeans strip my armor here, where I fell by the ships assembled. But hold strongly on and stir up all the rest of the people. And death closes mm -hmm. over his nostrils. Yes. Is that a beautiful death? I really love this particular scene for purposes of this particular question, because I, it seems to me that the full complexity, maybe of the entire epic is all right here. I mean, just the way that Homer pivots from this beautiful image of the oak or white poplar falling, you know, a towering pine, and then pivots immediately to the world of things that human beings make shipwrights on a mountain hew down with wetted axes for a sturdy ship timber. And I think just That's that nice. right there, yeah. that it combines so seamlessly the natural and the man-made, the way in which all of this is a kind of interplay between what's natural and what is violence against the natural. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder where, where the beauty is. Is the beauty in the natural aspect here? Is it in the poplar falling? Or is the beauty somehow even in that, that violent relation between the human being and the natural world? And we're, we're trying to mark ourselves out from the natural world in some way by making things, tearing things down, yeah. maybe even by doing violence to yeah. one another in the context of defending the city that we've built, you know, these kinds of things. It's just, it's very complicated, I think. So the falling, like a great pine mm -hmm. or an oak, seems both man-made and natural mm -hmm. at the same time. And then the question is, you gotta make something of my fallen timber, mm -hmm. you who are still living, Glaucus and the mm -hmm. men, and that means, you know, getting the armor, mm -hmm. taking care of the body, and, yeah. and not letting me become a thing of reproach or of shame. Mm -hmm. So that, that's quite a charge to give to mm -hmm. someone. Yeah. Uh, in some ways, it's almost, it almost feels bigger than my life is in your hands. It's what goes beyond my life is in your hands, even, even more than the question of my living and dying. As, mm -hmm. as a mortal on this earth, but the question of my being or non-being as as something worthwhile. And mm -hmm. you're, I think that's right, that that becomes this massive burden mm -hmm. that he puts on them. And yet the burden is also the opportunity, right? It's the opportunity to participate in the making glorious of things that are ugly, you know, the, the sprawled and roaring falling body clawing the bloody dust. Yeah, the clawing of the dust mm -hmm. with one's fingers, which then gets mm -hmm. turned into the clawing of the, the lion. lion into the hide of the bull. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's an extraordinary poetic mm -hmm. transformation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. that, because it turns Sarpedon's agony mm -hmm. in the dust, 
with his hand clawing it into, in a way, a potential triumph. Mm -hmm. The lion's claw mm -hmm. in the hide of the victim, the bull. Because you, you sort of think of him by means of the claw as not only the victim, but the lion. Right. If Glaucus will do what he's asked to do. Right. Contingent yeah. on follow through from his comrades. But I think yeah. it's exactly that that makes this passage so complex. Multiple on a dime poetic transformations from a falling oak to it's been chopped down and from clawing the dust to the lion clawing the bull. And yeah. I think it is you know, it sort of shows us that these things are so bound up in one another that it's almost impossible to think them separately from one another. The sort of, you know, the possibility of ingloriousness and the possibility of victory, mm -hmm. that these are in some ways in this moment of uncertainty, both things are there. You know, it is both possible that he will be the lion that victoriously takes down the bull, mm -hmm. or it's possible that he will be merely fingers clawing the dust yeah. and maybe that's what keeps us coming back for Indeed. more yeah. you know keeps us reading we got to know yeah i do find every time i go back to the iliad that i love it more mm -hmm. yes yeah. it's a book that really deepens and mm -hmm. grows on me over time yes you know though for the freshman facing it for the first time all of the battles all of the fallings into the dust mm -hmm. and there are many of them and they all get named Mm -hmm. These warriors, uh, it can be. It can be. Um, I mean, some of them might find it a little tedious mm -hmm. to go through all that. You know, mm -hmm. that cataclysmic description mm -hmm. of destruction and death, um, and also some of them raise, I think, the very legitimate question. And this, this, in a way, goes back to where we started with mention of justice and the republic. When we're talking about the beauty of the warrior in moments like these, mm -hmm. does the question of cause or that for which they are fighting in mm -hmm. the, say, the larger political sense mm -hmm. or the moral sense, does it matter? I mean, the Trojans and Sarpedians fighting for the Trojans mm -hmm. are fighting, yes, to defend Troy, but they're under attack because they stole, Paris stole mm -hmm. Helen, right. a married woman, and carried her off to Troy, mm -hmm. that doesn't seem like a beautiful cause to be defended. Mm -hmm. Does that matter? I think it's interesting whether the sort of broader context of all of this does in some way make contingent the glory. And it seems to me that at least in the Iliad, the fact that they're fighting over stolen women, it seems not quite to cast a pall over the entirety of the enterprise as though, well, you can only win glory if the war was worthwhile. You can mm -hmm. only win glory if the cause was just. It seems to me that if that's the case, then one side can't win any glory because mm -hmm. somebody's got it wrong, right? Someone's cause is not righteous here. And so if glory is contingent on the righteousness or the justice in one's cause, then there can't be glory on both sides. And in this poem, there's glory on both sides. And the gods are said all of the time to give Hector glory, or in this moment, they gave Odysseus glory. You know, mm. And that, it seems to me, wouldn't be possible if the nobility of the cause were really what conditioned the possibility of doing these beautiful deeds. So it is an interesting question, I think. I mean, there's so little mention of justice in this book. That's right. It's so conspicuously absent in yeah. some ways. The only times I think it really ever comes up are not in the context of the war itself and that for, sake of, for the sake of which, it's in the context of fighting over Briseis, mm -hmm. the conflict over the trophies and the stuff that they've gotten from the war. It's when they go back to the barracks and they're sorting out who's going to get which stuff and who deserves which prize. Yeah, that's very interesting because, I mean, the book opens with a great quarrel between Achilles mm -hmm. and Agamemnon because Agamemnon um, dishonors Achilles. Mm -hmm. But it could have been fought over Agamemnon did something unjust. Mm -hmm. But that's not how it's understood. You know, taking away Achilles' mm -hmm. prize is unjust. Mm -hmm. um, but it's felt simply as dishonorable, right. as ugly, as besmirching mm -hmm. everything Achilles stands mm -hmm. for. 
yeah, you have yeah. shamed me, yeah. seems to be his primary complaint. And I do these glorious deeds and I come back and you give me a pittance. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've, I get, I'm, I think he compares himself to a mother bird mm -hmm. who, you know, he's left to sort of gather scraps. And I think that's sort of interesting that it looks like there's almost been a kind of supplanting of concerns for justice by concerns for glory. Mm -hmm. As though in this context, it's got to be this thing that shines forth and is visible. Yeah, you were saying that, you know, justice in some way, it doesn't shine forth in a visible way, or at least not in an obvious way. Whereas yeah. glory maybe puts something on the surface that men can care about. It makes it seem like, okay, Helen, the taking of Helen or the taking of, even of Briseis away from Achilles are, are, you know, they're not what's important. They just allow men to go to mm -hmm. war or to augment the honor of fighting. Mm -hmm. you know, they're a kind of pretext for it all. Mm -hmm. What really matters is being in battle, doing the deeds that they're doing, shining, mm -hmm. being talked about, written about. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet Achilles' degree of investment in Briseis seems to have a kind of depth that makes her more than just another prize. You know, he, he, he weeps and he's, you know, one gets the sense that there's something he wants from having this woman that's maybe different in kind from what one wants from having even the armor, you know, the, yeah. the beautiful armor that somehow Achilles has needs that yeah. fall outside the, the scope of glory and battle. Yeah, so let me, uh, before I forget, go, go in that direction with you because, you know, we mentioned earlier that scene with Paris mm -hmm. where he's coming out of the bedroom with Helen just as Hector is coming away from Andromache and his son to go off into battle. But that is in a way pointing at, there's a, there's a whole other way of life. Mm -hmm. You know, what they call it a domestic life, married life, mm -hmm. family, peace in a word. Uh, and Achilles is thinking about that, mm -hmm. you know, a lot while yeah. he's abstaining from battle. Um, but we get it in a way in the Odyssey. Mm -hmm the homecoming of Odysseus. Yeah. And what interests me, at least for, for this present discussion, on um, justice and war and the beautiful, mm -hmm. when, Achille, uh, when Odysseus comes, finally gets home and faces all these suitors who have been eating him out of, out of house and home mm -hmm. and forcibly sleeping with the maidservants and trying to kill his son and trying to get Penelope, that is doing a lot of very unjust things. Mm -hmm. And Odysseus kills them all. Mm -hmm. But it's not, to my mind anyway, tell me what you think about this, it, it's not beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's satisfying because they deserve it somehow. And one feels like in a Hollywood movie, yes! You know, <laughs> Go get him! Finally, you know, the arrow's going through the throat of the bad guy as he's drinking. Yeah, the blood and the wine yeah. mingling is yeah. really something. But, but is, is it, uh, and they're all, uh, initially at least, they're unarmed and he's just mm -hmm. picking them off. You know, that's not like death on a battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes more like a battlefield when they get armor. But is that because it's about a question of justice and cause really matters in the Odyssey, whereas in the Iliad, this book, what matters is just making war mm -hmm. for the display of virtue. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I think there is something to be said for the possibility that one can't win glory slaughtering people in the context of the home. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me when I read that scene that it is not the kind of thing where one goes to win glory by getting rid of the unwelcome guest. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say, yeah, there is a difference between a, a battle on the battlefield and violence done in the home for the sake of restoring the integrity of the home. Mm -hmm. And I, I think maybe we see that in the way that Homer depicts them. But there is also something sort of beautiful that happens even in the slaughter in the halls where Odysseus and his son stand side by side uh, yes. in battle. And, you know, yes, that's a domestic relationship. And later the father, too. Yes, and then you have three of them. And, and you know, he says that you know, there is no greater joy than to see one's sons talking battle and standing side by side in battle, you know, mm -hmm. to see Odysseus and Telemachus side by side in the context that they're going to stand up and hold their ground 
in a battle against the the townsmen who are coming for them. So it, the the line between the domestic and the warlike is not obvious, I think, in yeah. Homer. You know, it's troubled, but not decisive, yeah, yeah. this distinction. No, you're right. You're reminding me now that at a certain point in the slaughter of the suitors, mm -hmm. um, uh, we get an image of one of the deaths of the suitors, which mm -hmm. could be straight out of the Italy. Mm -hmm. You know, you're falling into the dust, yes. the armor clatters about you, and it's like you're back on the battlefield mm -hmm. suddenly. And that makes me worried that the war, what the warrior wants, the returning warrior, Odysseus, come home, mm -hmm. is somehow not to become a peaceful farmer or whatever, or mm -hmm. just a peaceful king. Mm -hmm. But he still brings with him that thirst mm -hmm. for a battle, for passing it on to his son mm -hmm. and standing by his son and his father. That, mm -hmm. that there's something, therefore, kind of awful mm -hmm. about the warrior coming home. Because mm -hmm. your home becomes, you know, he wants the battle again. You know, it's right. I think that is, there's got to be something. He's too big, you know. He's mm -hmm. too. Right. How does one become a hero and then go home to be a father and a husband? And can one be yeah, a hero, father, and husband simultaneously? One man, all of these things. Can you actualize all of those aspects of the self in any one particular context, maybe not, and have things be healthy. I mean, it is not a good thing to have your your dining hall run with blood. They have to purify the hall after the slaughter. So that does suggest that there is a kind of tension there. But also, I think, as you say, it's not that Odysseus is just going to leave it all behind. You know, he's bringing it home. He's bringing the violence home. And it makes me think about Achilles in the underworld in the Odyssey, what Achilles says to Odysseus about how, how he wishes he could have gone home and been with his father. Oh, what I wouldn't give you know, to be in the halls of my father. But then when he describes what he would be going home and doing with his father is being his father's comrade in arms. Yeah. So it's like they yeah. really can't disentangle even the domestic from the battle as though you can't really think of it as the one happens for the sake of the other and is done. You know, the war is done when it's done and has served its purpose in restoring justice mm -hmm. to the political and domestic lives of men. You know, for Achilles, he can't even really think his way into the role of being his father's son without framing it as yeah. being a soldier. Yeah, that is so different from the way we American, modern Americans mm -hmm. think of war where it should be a either a part-time occupation mm -hmm. for everyone out of necessity or perhaps full-time but only for certain people who are sort of off separately doing it but mm -hmm. don't bring it home with them whereas in the odyssey it seems like even among the people at home to, uh, telemachus mm -hmm. penelope they want the warrior mm -hmm. Odysseus the warrior, not mm -hmm. Odysseus the beggar, nice. who's 20 years older mm -hmm. and, um, and looks it, right. but Odysseus the warrior. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as if they're keeping, I've often wondered about this, why, why is there this problem with the suitors that they can't seem to solve, mm -hmm. make them go away? Mm -hmm. I mean, could it be that it, that's like Helen in the Iliad, that's the pretext for bringing back a warrior because he will then slaughter them and that's what they want. Mm -hmm. So it is very complicated, I think, you know, when they say exactly as you said, what they want is for Odysseus, this warrior, to come home and wipe these guys out. It's a couple of times Homer refers to it, uh, you know, people, yeah, Homer has people refer to it as if only Odysseus would come home, there would be a blood wedding. There wouldn't uh, be a wedding. You know, the suitors, you know, one of the suitors wouldn't wed Penelope, there'd be a blood wedding instead. And so it's that bringing together of the blood and the wedding, the violent and the domestic, or the violent and the political. And weddings aren't just domestic, they're also mm -hmm. social, political. There's something that holds the world of men together. And yet the blood, he brings the blood in. And mm -hmm. I think it does, I guess we can't really neatly separate it out again as a kind of this for the sake of that. It looks like 
the violence has a place somehow yeah. in in the world of men's domestic or social and political doings. But the idea of a pretext, I think, is difficult. I'm not really sure what to make of that. That would be a sort of painful idea if it turned out that ultimately it's actually the domestic and political that's for the sake of war. Yeah, that's the that challenging we, thought. That we, we go about all of this and ultimately what we want is a stage on which to display the most glorious of our to, virtues. To display that what you love is really beautiful and lovable, mm -hmm. I would put it. Yeah, it's, I'm pushing things here, but I've often wondered about Penelope, mm -hmm. how she keeps these suitors hanging on, mm -hmm. you know, with the kind of yes-no mm -hmm. relation she has to them. Um, and I've come to think more and more, It's be, and she's the one who comes up with the idea of the bow right. through the, you know, mm -hmm. all those targets, which mm -hmm. puts the bow in his hands. Right and begins the slaughter, you know, that she's keeping them around precisely for that reason. Mm -hmm. Even though she sleeps through the whole thing. Yes, it's wonderful. Yeah. Someone's always coming along and closing her eyes with gentle sleep <laughs> at yeah. just the right moment. Yeah, because she wants the warrior mm -hmm. back, mm -hmm. the one she sent off. Um, but anyway, thinking of, about those two, you know, this wonderfully married couple, mm -hmm. You know, it is a beautiful marriage, mm -hmm. I think. They have a kind of um, compatibility mm -hmm. that is, is hard to find in, in mm -hmm. literature. Um, it makes me think of a poem about the beauty of war, which I re I've shared with you by Hausman. Mm -hmm. Would you like to read it? Sure, yeah, okay. hand it over. <laughs> I thought you were going to go to the Shakespearean sonnet that begins, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediment, uh -huh. <laughs> thinking about the, the beauty of yeah. Penelope and Odysseus's marriage. So, yeah, so this, yes. this poem by Hausman I discovered some years ago when reading um, Aristotle's Ethics. Mm -hmm. And um, we were trying to understand the first of the virtues that Aristotle lists, mm -hmm. uh, which is courage. And he gives five kinds of virtues, uh, five kinds of courage. Mm -hmm. And the only real and true kind of courage, the others are kind of lesser images of it, is courage shown facing death mm -hmm. precisely on the battlefield mm -hmm. in man-to-man -man or hand-to-hand -hand combat. Mm -hmm. So that kind of battle and death mm -hmm. is where courage, according to Aristotle, is most purely and beautifully seen. Mm -hmm. And someone brought this poem up as, as a good example of what Aristotle is mm -hmm. getting at. All right. I did not lose my heart in summers even, when roses to the moonrise burst apart, when plumes were under heel and lead was flying in blood and smoke and flame, I lost my heart. I lost it to a soldier and a foeman, a chap that did not kill me, but he tried that took the saber straight and took it striking and laughed and kissed his hand to me and died. <laughs> Talk about tangling up the beautiful and the ugly, the natural and the violent. But took the saber straight and took it mm -hmm. striking, laughed, kissed his hand to me and died. Mm -hmm. That I can see. Mm -hmm. um, in my imagination, and it's it's a powerful image. Mm -hmm. What do you think? It's and it's the it's the moment in which the you know the victor of that encounter falls mm -hmm. in love with the person he slayed. Mm -hmm. So, so we're thinking about life lived in these moments, and maybe as opposed to as a kind of story, but that I think is an interesting, maybe a tension or maybe not in Homer that. I think you're right that there is something about the moment, the moment of death, mm -hmm. the moment in which you either charge or run, that these are things that happen almost out of time. But at the same time, the story seems to be the thing that they're all really concerned about. They want, they want their story to be told mm -hmm. and not just the moment. So this difference between the way in which the life is lived and the actions are taken 
as opposed to what one leaves that transcends and somehow That's supports the glory. And yeah. I think I am sort of struggling with how to resolve those two things, the importance of the story and yet the fundamental being of the thing as momentary yeah. and well, fleeting. So being part of a story, um, one's own or someone else's, mm -hmm. that interests me. Um, because maybe there's a way the characters in uh, the warriors in the Iliad mm -hmm. are, are, well, they obviously are part of a story, a big story mm -hmm. um, of a Trojan War. And even if they're minor characters who just get named at the moment of their death, mm -hmm. they've been made part of something big. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if, if that's worth thinking about more, that maybe mm -hmm. that's it, wanting to be a part of something, mm -hmm. a story that makes even the ugliness and the horror mm -hmm. of war beautiful, something to be yeah. chosen and pursued mm -hmm. because the story is worth it. I wonder then, just thinking about this idea that what one wants is to be part of a story that is bigger than only the moments through which we live live ourselves out, whether I mean, this question of glory and justice seems like it comes back into play. Mm -hmm. It looks like glory and the story are very much bound up in one another in Homer's treatment of war. But then there's a question, I think, can justice do the same thing? Can it serve the same purpose? Can it provide the foundation for the story that allows the moment of death to take place in the context of something that is larger, something that is coherent and continuous, so that we're not just a scatter, a scattering of moments, mm -hmm. you know, so that there's an arc and an arc that maybe even transcends from the moment of my birth to the moment of my death. So I'm wondering now, you know, whether justice could in some way be the foundation for that kind of a story. Do you think we might have an example in our own history, say the American yeah. Civil War? That seems like a good example insofar as the question of who is on the side of justice is so much at stake and explicitly made a question by the great leaders of that yeah. period of time. Yeah, so I'm thinking... Yeah. Uh, of our, let's call him our Homer, namely <laughs> Lincoln. Yeah. Ah. yeah. Our, our dear colleague Eva Brand has said to me several times, and she's now persuaded me, that Lincoln is the great American poet. Mm -hmm. our, our bard of war, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, does he do, say, at Gettysburg what Homer does? Though he gives to the war and all those slaughtered dead. Mm -hmm that the Americans had seen in newspaper photos and mm -hmm. were horrified at right. these images. Uh, he, he takes those very images and says, you know, let them not have died in vain, mm -hmm. but let there be this new birth of freedom. Mm -hmm. By the way, I was talking with, with George Russell in these very chairs <laughs> last week about this. But, you know, it's coming up again. I mean, it seems to me um, that he's making it beautiful as a cause, mm -hmm. you know, right. a cause of liberty, equality, mm -hmm. justice. Mm -hmm. Does that seem right to you? I think that is, yeah, it, it, it's a different way of thinking about it, certainly, than Homer's way of thinking about it, it mm -hmm. seems to me. But I do think it's the same kind of urge to say, this is not arbitrary going on I guess it's not arbitrary actions on the part of men for the sake of simply making moments. You know, mm -hmm. This is something bigger and worthy. And it does seem to me that in a way that provides maybe the same kind of coherence that a story would provide. It's mm -hmm. not a story, it seems to me. It's mm -hmm. different, I think, than a narrative of which one can be a part you know, to be a character in a larger story. That seems to me to be a different way of sort of, I mean, I guess maybe saving oneself mm -hmm. from the existential yeah. terror of being a mere momentary creature. But what about how it, the Gettysburg Address begins, you know, four score and seven mm -hmm. years ago? It sounds like, I mean, he's bringing us back to the beginning mm -hmm. of the story of American, mm -hmm. this American experiment in self-government. Mm -hmm. 
and saying we're now testing it. It's sort of like we're in the middle mm -hmm. of the story with the Civil War and how it's going to end. Who knows? Right. But you know, we're we're in a story that's mm -hmm. worth working on, even at this price mm -hmm. of all these dead in battle. Mm -hmm. To me, that's an extraordinary, maybe equally extraordinary to, to Sarpedon saying, you know, the thing to do with death all around us is to charge into battle mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and achieve this glory. Right. To play our part. I mean, he describes yeah. what their role has been as the greatest of the men in their army. To, they're the ones who are honored in this way, and they they eat these things at dinner because they play this role in this story. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, the idea of maybe one needs the story in order to have a role that one can play, mm -hmm. and the role that one plays somehow does lend a kind of coherence mm -hmm. to it. And I think it, what you say makes sense, that there is a way in which Lincoln is telling us this is a, a story, it's a narrative, it begins before you begin mm -hmm. and it will continue after you've gone on gone on your way and i think maybe hmm, i think what you say about the fact that the outcome of the story is uncertain the fact that we don't actually know where we are in the story at any given moment, mm -hmm. especially in war, it's in some ways plainest to us that yeah. we don't know where we are in the story because death might be coming at any moment and Zeus might tip the scales at any moment and give glory to the other side. Maybe he'll give glory to us, maybe he'll give glory to them. And so not knowing the outcome of the story and yet having the fact that there's a story relieve us of that sort of burden of being mere momentary creatures seems seems important and it sounds like maybe justice and the justice of the cause and the politics could be a story that would that would serve the purpose yeah what does it mean to be in a story mm -hmm. that is in the process of being mm -hmm. written and you don't know right. what the ending is your co-author at mm -hmm. the moment it's happening yes um, and you have some some real sense of uh, creative power right. in that moment but you're going to have to let it pass it on to someone else to continue mm -hmm. and that's you know that's you know requires some real trust mm -hmm. in the future i wonder if that trust is harder to come by these days and maybe another way of putting it is do you think modern war you know despite what i'm trying to argue now about the civil war is just not you know the kind of beautiful story, either individual or collective, that one finds, say, in Homer or in Virgil, and in you know these mm -hmm. old accounts that, for us, it's simply mechanized and awful and not choice worthy, not beautiful, and um, you know maybe sort of like one interpretation of the Hausman poem that you gave a moment ago, which was written in the aftermath of the mm -hmm. First World War, um, that it's, you know, good riddance to all that. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. Is that where you, we are as moderns? It seems to me a sort of frightening possibility that, yes, that's where we are, but one wonders whether that was some sort of choice that was made or whether it was a discovery that that's the way things are. And that when one writes epic poems about war that are exquisitely beautiful, one is hiding something. And mm -hmm. that, you know, when it's said that a man dies like a flower weighed down by the weight of the rain, you know, this beautiful death yeah. as a flower, a poppy whose head just sort of falls to the ground, that that's a lie because he didn't feel like he was a flower yeah. sinking to the ground. You know, yeah. his, his, <laughs> His teeth probably clawed the dust a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's possible that we've sort of allowed that ugliness to come to the forefront. And maybe that was made inevitable by the mechanization, by the just the sheer scale of slaughter, yeah. that it's hard still to retain an element of the natural or the beautiful when we're thinking yeah. about that. Well, another possibility is, and I don't like thinking of it this way, but it comes from Shakespeare, mm. who wrote his own version of the Trojan War mm -hmm. in Troilus and Cressida. Mm -hmm. And do you know that play? I don't. I'm well, I'll tell you one thing that will amuse you. 
Um, so in that, uh, you know, so all the great characters of the Trojan War there, Achilles, mm -hmm. Hector, Paris, and so on. And Achilles, because he sits out of the war for some time mm -hmm. um, because of being dishonored by Agamemnon, what hap uh, the question Shakespeare asks himself as a modern writer, <laughs> you know, giving you the true story of the war, what happens when you stop exercising? Mm -hmm. You get fat. <laughs> A similar thing has happened to Hamlet, if yeah. I recall. <laughs> he right. gets a little out of shape, and when so, it's time for the duel, he's... So Achilles is in, <laughs> in Shakespeare's Trojan War, is mm -hmm. fat, out of breath, can't kill Hector in mm -hmm. the glorious, courageous way, has to resort to a kind of trick. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the challenge Shakespeare is presenting us is, this is the way it was. This is the way it always mm -hmm. was. And that... What we're getting in Homer is a lie. I appreciate Shakespeare's <laughs> attempt there, but I don't believe for a minute that Homer's Achilles just sat around by the ships. Mm -hmm. There is no way that he wasn't exercising daily. I mean, that man lived in his body in a way that I think is, it's almost hard to fathom, but I don't think that Achilles' body ever sat around and and took any form other than the body of the warrior. So I think Homer must have persuaded me of something, yeah, which is that at least for these men, to simply sit around and let your warrior's body deteriorate would not have been an option, which mm -hmm. maybe suggests that in fact, there was beauty in it for them. Unless he's telling us lies about the way things were and the things that human beings at his time took seriously and believed, and that's mm -hmm. possible. But he's at least persuaded me that it is possible that there were human beings for whom it was actually possible to access beauty in the context of war. Mm -hmm. So I guess maybe Homer's persuaded me of something. And at the same time, Shakespeare can also, I think, be right that there are mm -hmm. human beings and contexts in which that's not possible, mm -hmm. in which there is no such thing as a view of oneself and of war that would cause one not to want to lose one's warrior's body mm -hmm. even while sitting the battle out. Well, here's, here's a third possibility. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can, it's a good place to, you know, pause our conversation till the next time. But what if it's not Homer mm -hmm. or Shakespeare, you know, the beauty of war, the ugliness of war, but it's uh, Plato and Socrates, mm -hmm. a new form of courage Mm -hmm. That of doing what we're doing now, mm -hmm. talking, right. you know, about things that matter mm -hmm. with the help of these great authors. Mm -hmm. uh, we happen to be doing it on film, so we're <laughs> going to be immortal in a certain way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to be reminded of that, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's a, and it you know for Socrates that takes a kind of courage. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was put to death finally yes. for th having those kinds of conversations. You know, you and I don't. I think have to fear that kind of mm -hmm. possibility, but but that there is an exercise of a certain kind of courage mm -hmm. in speaking freely mm -hmm. about things, and maybe a beauty, mm -hmm. maybe a falling in love, maybe all the things we've been talking about are to be had in our capacity as speakers. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's really, in a way, what what we believe in because what we, that's what we do? I think it's absolutely true that one, when one seriously takes up the question of justice or virtue, you know, when one really, truly in earnest tries to ask a real question, one inevitably puts oneself at risk because if you open yourself up to the inquiry, you don't know where you're going to end up. You don't know where you are in that story. You could end up in a place that you didn't want to be if you followed the conversation, if you followed the idea, you know, if you chase down the yeah. idea as Socrates does with the interlocutor, you don't know where you might end up. And so it's risky. I think as soon as you open your mouth to publicly say, I'm in pursuit of the truth about this now, anything could happen. Yeah. And I sort of am reminded again of Hannah Arendt talks about this being the sort of, in some ways, defining characteristic of the political sphere, that one is at risk when one enters into the political arena. Mm -hmm. And when, in particular, when one opens one's mouth to say something that matters in front right. of one's fellow citizens, 
is a risk always. And partly for the reasons that you pointed out, the stakes might be as high as you've said what is not okay to say. And so now we're going to get rid of you. But it also is just to put oneself in front of one's peers and be willing to be forthright. And they might look at you and laugh. They might laugh. They might refute you. Yeah. You might discover that what you thought to be true and give meaning to mm -hmm. your life is, is, is either doubtful or wrong. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much, Erica. This was a very enjoyable Thank you. I discussion. enjoyed it as well. Okay. Very good. All right. Until next time. Indeed. I hope that will come soon.